great to be back. Um, we had a wonderful time on our vacation. I'm going to share a little bit about that uh, as I get into this morning's message. But uh, uh, it was it was nice to have some time away, and it, it's uh, great to be back. I'm just I'm just excited about uh, everything that's going on. And today's message is one that came to me. It's Isaiah 55. If you're going to follow along in your Bible and want to get there ahead of me. Um, Isaiah 55, and today we're gonna, what you're going to get is the whole book of Isaiah in about 45 minutes. No, about 25 minutes. I'm kidding. This is not going to be. <laughs> so, um, but the prophet Isaiah, he, he's writing, uh, his, his writing takes place at a time when Israel is moving into its, its first captivity, and he prophesies in and through its second, uh, when, when Jerusalem finally falls and, and the uh, tribes of Judah are taken off in, in the Babylon Empire, and ultimately his prophecy reaches all the way into the foretelling of the coming of the Christ Messiah and his redemption of all peoples, uh, Jews and Gentiles, and it's, it's a great message. Message. So now when you're in the back half of Isaiah, it's pretty positive messages that are coming out. And so we're in 55, and we're going to be looking at that whole chapter. I'm going to read it here in just a minute in its entirety. It's, it's only 13 verses long, so that's not uh, too terrible. But uh, Isaiah is talking to people. Now when I was a kid growing up, this was, uh, there was a, uh, an, an elderly lady friend of the family. that This was her favorite passage, and it came up all the time. She was always talking about it. Then whenever it would come up in church, and then she would want to discuss it with, with, as we got together in family gatherings and stuff. Uh, for me, I, I always walked away. Um, it, it was kind of funny because it starts with, Ho there. And so as a kid, I'm just, I, I'd run around all the time after we would hear this passage uh, talked about and stuff. Ho there. And my mom would be like, what are you doing, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. It just sounded funny to me. So I'm like, ho there. Every time somebody would come around and, and do something, but we'll get into it. So Isaiah starts out, ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and a commander for the peoples. See, you shall call nations that you do not know and nations that you do not know shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord let the, that he may have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven, and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come forth the cypress, and instead of the briar shall come forth the myr myrtle, and it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. And so I kind of just want to walk through this um, passage a little bit and um, just break it down a little bit verse by verse as we move through. This is, uh, uh, I was reminded of this uh, passage as we had started out on our vacation. And as I get into this, you'll understand a little more why and how that came to be. But Isaiah's admonishment here is to come, to seek, and to celebrate. To have joy and peace at no cost to the one seeking, to the one who is repentant. It is open there. And it, it really kind of breaks down into three different parts, this, this entire chapter. The first is the invitation. There is an invitation set out by God to the people. 
not just the people of, of Israel who will find themselves in captivity and eventually will be led out of it, but to all nations, to all persons. And that's who's invited. He's inviting everyone. Anyone that wants to partake in what God has to offer can. The door is open. It is an unlimited atonement that Christ has offered up as a sacrifice on the cross. And anyone who thirsts can come. Anyone who is looking for meaning in their life can, can come to know who God is and the purpose that he has planned for them. Anyone who has a desire, that, that word thirst, that's really all it's talking about, is a desire. What is it that, that you're longing to fulfill in your heart of hearts? Anyone that has a desire can come to God. And it doesn't cost you anything. It is the true bargain of the century. For nothing out of you other than the mere desire to come to know God, you can be. Now, there's an alternative Isaiah lays out in here, and that is spending your money for that which is not food. Now, understand that there's a lot of different, you know, food is, is like uh, when, when you're talking about money, it becomes the analogy for a lot of things because we all have hungers, we all have desires, we all have in us things that we want whether it's for food itself or hunger for other things in, in life. And so Isaiah's warning here from, from the Word of God is to not spend on the junk food of life. While everybody likes a Twinkie now and then, and probably is the greatest apocalyptic food out there because it will last forever, which lets you know that there's probably no food quality to it whatsoever. You can't have a steady diet of that stuff and feel good. It is food that is not food. As opposed to the health food. And, you know, that, that's a whole other industry. But there are things that you eat that are better fuel for you than other things. And Isaiah said, don't spend your money. Don't spend your energy. Don't spend your time amassing things that will ultimately leave you empty or not fuel you in ways that are positive. Rather, do it some other way. And don't labor for things that don't satisfy you. Don't pour your energy into fruitless gains. Is, the, is what he's talking about here. I read an uh, article, um, and I don't, I don't read a lot of these tabloid-type stuff, and I don't really follow uh, all the superstars of, of sports and celebrities of Hollywood that much. But I, I did come across this one. Um, Brad Pitt was being interviewed, and he said that, and I'll just quote him, Man, I know all these things are supposed to seem important to us. The cars, the condo, our version of success. But if that's the case, why is the general feeling out there reflecting more impotence and isolation and desperation and loneliness? He goes on to say that, I'm telling you, once you've got everything, then you're left with yourself. I've said it before and I'll say it again. It doesn't help you sleep any better and you don't wake up any better because of it. Don't seek Things that don't satisfy. Isaiah wrote these words long ago and they're just as true today to us. He starts out with ho there. Which really, you know, ho is just a, an old English translation of an ancient language that means, hey, listen up, pay attention. There's something I'm about to say from the Word of God that can be of benefit to you, so pay attention and eat what is good and delight yourself in rich food. Well, what is the rich food he's talking about? Well, in verse 3, he says, incline your ear. You know, I, I have a hard time hearing sometimes, and so incline your I do it all the time. Somebody says something I don't understand, and I, I, I turn my ear 
all the time so that I can clear it. Sound, some sounds mumble and, and there, you know, there's, there's just things in my hearing that aren't, aren't as great as they were when I was 18 or 20 or even 40. And so incline your ear though. Get over here and listen because something's coming forward. And come to me. Listen, he says, so that you may live. The God of hosts has a word for each one of us, and the reason for that word is that we might have life, that we might live. This is what the fulfillment of Jesus said, I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. God is on your team, as my father-in-law would say. I thought we were on the same team. He says that all the time. I don't know how many teams he's got, but everybody's on his team. And God is on your team. He's on your side. He cares about you as an individual. And as easy as it is to get lost in, in the minutia of things in life and to, to just feel like one insignificant something in a world gone mad, the creator of that world cares about you. He has a desire for you to know who he is. And he says, listen, so that you might live, so that you might have a joyous life, that you might prosper in the moments of your day. He goes on to say, I will make with you an everlasting covenant. I love that word everlasting because it means it doesn't end. It doesn't end tomorrow when bad things happen. It doesn't end next week when, when the things I had hoped for don't come to fruition. It doesn't end at the end of my days on this earth. It is an everlasting covenant. It is a solid bond with the creator of the universe that I might walk with him in all ways and all days. In verse 5 he says, You will call nations that don't know you, and nations you don't know will run to you. And he's talking about the glory of Israel and the glory of David's kingdom established forever. So ultimately what he's talking about is God's kingdom. And that the door is wide open to all people in all places. And that all nations will one day be unified in one place. And so in verse 6 he goes on to say, Seek the Lord while he may be found and call on him while he is near. And I want to assure you today that God has never been nearer to you than he is this moment. Seek him. In the New Testament, we are told that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And even though oftentimes things in this world make absolutely no sense to us where we stand, we know that we can turn to the creator of it all. And if we seek him, and if we diligently seek him, he will reward. And Isaiah is reminding people, seek the Lord while he may be found, because one day it's going to be too late. Peter writes that God is patient. He would that no one should perish, and so he delays in his coming back, so that everyone will have an opportunity to come to know him. But seek him while he may be found because one day your time runs out. My time ends. One day, ultimately, the king of kings comes riding back in glory and reestablishes creation in the way it was meant to be. And when that time is, comes to an end, it's too late. So seek him while he may be found. And I'm telling you, he may be found right next to you, because that's where he's at. You might be in a place in your life where you've been running from God for, for many, many years. I don't know where you're at. But I'm telling you, he's right on your heels. And if you will stop and look, he's right there waiting for you to come back to him. Seek him while he might be found. Look for him while he is still there. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous turn from their ways. And let them return to God, that they may have mercy on them. God will abundantly pardon. What Isaiah is saying is that there's nothing 
that he can't forgive. There's nothing that God won't forgive. He has paid the penalty for all the things that you have done or thought or wanted to do or, or, or wished you'd done or felt like you have done. It's all been paid. And he is there for us to forgive that. And he reminds us that my thoughts are not your thoughts. And my ways are not your ways. And so sometimes we sit in the midst of our circumstance in life and we think to ourselves, there is no God. Or where are you, God? Or why have you abandoned me, God? And I pray and I pray and I pray and I pray and nothing changes. And where are you? And he reminds us, don't sweat it. As high as the heavens are over the earth, that's the difference between the way I think and the way I act and the way I work to the way you think and understand. And although you may not understand it all right now, there's coming a day when you will. And if you will just trust me, if you will just continue to have faith in the things you can't see, that you can't understand, that you don't feel that there's anything moving in, if you just hang on, I will be there to reveal it all one day, that you might know what it is and why these things have happened to you and how this all will work so that when I see the full mosaic someday in glory, I will have a better understanding. But you have to trust that he has your best interest at heart, that he cares for you, and that he is reaching out to you continually. And I say, so as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return, and I always stop right there, ever, I say, the snow just lays here, right? No, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return until they've accomplished their purpose. It is sent for a reason, to nourish and to bring about. And so whatever it is, rain is, is that's falling in your life, and I'm not saying that, you know, bad things happen so that Whatever, I, I'm not getting into all of that. What I'm telling you is that, that rain falls, snow falls. Things happen in this world, and there's a purpose to it. I'll never understand it. I'll never get my head around some of the things that, that go on, that, that how could you allow this to happen. But it will not return until it's accomplished its purpose. And God says, so the word of my mouth will also. It goes out with a purpose and it will accomplish that purpose. And it will not return void. It will not return not having accomplished what I have set it to do. And so then there's the celebration part of the passage. He says, for you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. And so I want to stop right there and share with you my vacation story. Because we went out in joy and we were led back in peace. We left out of here and we started, with our, our idea was that we had rented a house in Arizona and we were going to drive out there and we were going to spend the week there, visit some family, some friends, uh, take in a couple of events, do some travel and drive back. And we went out in joy with all the expectations of vacation and things were behind us and everything was set and the truck was packed and we roll out. We run into sunshine, sunshine about Indianapolis and 14 days of sunshine. And for those of you who know me, I'm, I'm like solar powered with terrible batteries. I go in the sunshine and I get a lot done as soon as clouds come in. It's, it's tough for me. So... 14 days of sunshine, it was great. We're rolling down gloriously on, on uh, the Monday morning. We get up, load up from the hotel. We head on, get, we're at the gas station. It's, everything's wonderful. We're coming out of Kentucky, and we get into to just outside of Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, Wendy looks over at me and says, what's that sound? We're in the Hammer Lane, about 80 mile an hour, off 75, because I think that's the speed limit right there. And uh, I said, it's nothing. And immediately, as we're coming up the mountain there, boo, the truck starts bogging down. I said, well, it's something. And smoke starts billowing out the back of the truck. And I'm in the hammer lane at 80 mile an hour. There's cars all around. I'm like, I don't even know what to do here. 
I don't know how much, there's nothing I can do here. There's a mountain right there. So I got to get over to the right and get off. And as I start ramping over and I'm just bogging down, it just, we just slid right over three lanes and the ramp was right there. We coasted down the ramp. I stop at the stop sign. There's no power. The truck's dead. I look at Wendy. I said, you're going to have to get over here behind the wheel and steer as I push. And I jump out of the truck. And by the time she gets around and I get to the back of the truck, there's four cars stopped. There's four people out of nowhere, four young bucks leaning on the back of our truck, pushing it. Where do you want to get to? I said, just get it off the road here. We'll be good. We push it over to the side of the road. I look around. They're gone. They just jump in the truck, so they bail. They're out of there. I'm like, wow, <laughs> thank you, Lord. We parked the Red Sea right there. We coasted right down. Nobody got hit. I'm thinking there's no way we're getting out of this thing without something happening. So we're stuck on the side of the road. The motor's blown in our truck. First call I make is to the, clear, the, the closest dealership I can get a hold of. I don't know what else to do. I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. I don't know anybody. Uh, we got all of our stuff in, in the car. We're riding out in joy, and all of a sudden, the wheels literally come off the bus. So I call the dealership. They say, yeah, we can look at it, but it'll be four or five days before we can look at it. I'm like, I only got 14 days. I got to get back, so I'm not going to spend them here looking at you. Um, I said, can you give me a name of a wrecker? They gave me a name of a wrecker guy. I call him. He answers the phone right then. I don't know about you, but I've discovered in the post-COVID world that telephones are useless. When's the last time you dialed a number and talked to a person after two or three rings? I mean, it just doesn't happen, right? So I dial the number, boom, the guy picks up the phone. He says, where are you at? I tell him. He said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. I call uh, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, the number that I can find closest uh, place. And I guess I, you know... I call them, the guy's like, yeah, well, um, I got a car for you, but I can't help you out, you're a little farther out than we go, he gives me the name of another uh, rental agency, I call them, they're like, we don't have any cars, I'm like, now what, so I call back to the other guy, I said, hey, they said they don't have any cars, he said, well, they're lying, but where are you at, I said, well, I told them where we're at, so I'll be there in 20 minutes, so <laughs> awesome. I uh, said, so what do you got? You know, I was telling them we got three people, and, and I said, two of them are ladies, so we got a lot of luggage. Most of it's mine. <laughs> but uh, he said, okay, I'll, I'll bring up. He said, you think you can get it on the minivan? I said, I think so. So he shows up. Uh, record guy gets there, hooks us up, drags us off the road. We're sitting in the parking lot. Um, he said, I, I don't want to leave you till the, till the other car gets here to pick you up. I just want to leave you on the side of the road. I said, why, am I in a bad area? Well, actually, Wendy said, why, is this a bad area? She said, <laughs> he's like, no, you're fine, you know. Um, and <laughs> so we finished, by the time we finished up the business with him and, and uh, start getting stuff out of the car, Enterprise is there. We load everything in. They run us back to their place. He takes the truck over to the dealership. Uh, they're like, the car, that, the price for the car that they had quoted us was... Um, less than the minivan price but he's looking at all our stuff and he looks at the car that he was going to give us and he's like you better just keep this and you're already in here and everything seems to fit so uh you're good to go and so at that point it's like what do we do well if you know me we're going <laughs> we're on vacation we're going we got a plan and we're going to stick with it and so the truck goes to the dealership we go on our, on our way and um I call, you know, talk to the uh, rental company. I'm like, hey, is there a way we can just keep this and uh, drop it back in Michigan? Because it's looking like not good news on the truck. It's done. Um, it's the, the word that comes from that is that it's probably in the neighborhood of $14,000 to pull the motor, drop a new one in it. Um, and the better news is that to get a crated motor from Ford is about eight or nine months. So I'm like, okay, obviously that truck's not coming back with us anytime soon. Can I take the car back to Michigan? Enterprise is like, we don't do one ways right now. Said there'd be a drop fee, about a dollar a mile. She said, where are you taking it to? I give him the address. He punches in. So that's like 750 bucks. So uh, given your circumstances, I'll go half on that. How's $300 sound? I said, if $300 is half of 750 to you, it's half of 750 to me. I'll take it. Right? That's how they sell you on stuff, right? So, like, sold. Boom, we're gone. We're rolling on. And uh, I talked to my niece. She's, she's an office manager for a dealership here in Michigan. She said, uh, I'll get a hold of transport, com transport company, Jody. We'll, we'll get your truck back to Michigan. She was just a blessing. She's like, do not worry about it at all. 
I'll get it back up here. We'll look at it. We'll see if there's a deal we can work out where we can, you know. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago I was talking to you about uh, finances and not going into debt. Don't finance a car, boy, I'll tell you. First question, got an extended warranty on it? No. Stinks to be you. Yes, it does. <laughs> we bought this truck 12 months ago. I made 11 payments on it. How much do you think I owe? Uh, <laughs> so, at this point, the, the, I mean, life's coming unraveled. And, and you know, um, my wife, I love her. She is awesome. But, boy, what a punch in the gut that initial thing was. And, but, man, by Wednesday... We're laughing, we're driving, we're having a great time. She said, if you told me on Monday that by Wednesday there'd be joy in this trip, she said, I, I would have slapped you. <laughs> I, mean, I, don't, I don't want to sound terrible about that. But, I, you know, it, it was not, joy was not in the offing in Monday afternoon, I'm just going to tell you. But we were able to, to find the blessing in and through that and go, now, I, I do wonder why no one's ever shared with me the wisdom of just renting a car when you drive somewhere on vacation. It's so simple and <laughs> relatively inexpensive because we actually saved in gas alone in the gas budget um, what it would have cost to drive the truck. So it really, it was, it, if I had just rented the car, we would have been even Stephen in, in price outcome to begin with. So I, I don't have a job with the rental company anytime soon. I'm not trying to advocate or or promote that industry. I'm just telling you that uh, in hindsight, boy, that would have been <laughs> saved us a whole lot of headache. So we went out in joy. And my niece kind of stepped in and she took care of a lot of things. And we went on and, and we had a glorious time. It was fabulous. I'll be happy to share with you uh, the, the beauty of, of God's creation that we saw as we traveled around. And we went out in joy. We came back in peace. And what I want to tell you is that I don't know where you're at in your life right now, and I don't know which wheels are coming off of which bus for you, but God loves you, and he's looking out for you, and he is there for you in the midst of whatever troubles you're facing. And I mean, I, I will just tell you, it is overwhelming to just see how he works in the lives of those who seek him. And he wants that relationship with you in a way that you will never understand. He has poured out all of himself that you might know him. And that whatever trials you're facing, whatever the future holds for you, he is there with you in each of those moments. And so the mountains and the hills before you will burst into song. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. And instead of thorns and briars coming up, it will be cypress and myrtle. And so what you see laying before you, whatever that chasm is, on the back side of it, I assure you that the God who cares for you is building something glorious for you to be a part of and to partake in. And I just encourage you to seek him while he is right next to you that you might come to know and understand that even in troubled times, He is there for you. And He is working things out to bring you to a place of peace and joy like you will never know. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we do thank you that there is joy and peace in the offing if we will just commit ourselves to seeking you, to living into your will for us and to being a part of your community, Lord. And so we just pray that you draw us closer to you as we seek you and we commit our futures to you and our, the paths of our lives knowing that you will straighten those ways and that you will smooth out the rough spots for us as we move. Lord, help us to trust in you and know that you have our back in all that we do. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.